This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's the Tuesday episode and I'm trying to actually release this on Tuesday. We'll see how well that works. Um, I probably only missed three or four campaigns and you probably don't miss too much out on them if you get it on the Friday episode. So uh, here you go and we'll get started. There's 58 of them and not a lot of big campaigns. There's a couple in there, uh, a lot of RPGs, especially because of the Spelljammer release, uh, trying to take advantage of the people that are sci-fi fans and um, just a few different things popping up here and there. Not a lot in Wargaming, um, but a few uh, board games did show up as well and a couple of cool models. So we'll get going. The Compass Archive is four sets of games for two players and it's in this weird sci-fi world set up in cardinal directions. So you have north, east, south, and west. A couple of them already have come out before, so there's some... Uh, if in the low chance you've already bought it, then you don't have to buy everything, but it's in the frequently asked questions as what to get. Um, it's just this weird world, and something's different in each area. I remember this one here for the West, the graphic for it from a while ago. Uh, has some really neat, trippy artwork. And, um, yeah, if you like the idea of uh trying something a little different a little weird you can get print and play files for free of the south if you want to see kind of the the vibe of everything but you can see the rules and play it on tabletop simulator to go from there but it's just a weird sci-fi universe that's expanded out into these other games so you get um, a lot of opportunity to interact with it through the different games see what's going on and uh, maybe become a new fan Soccer Duel, there's a lot of these games that come out with uh, different sports. Um, this is not necessarily a soccer match. It has more to do with matching the balls uh, from the look of things. You can also get it based on Octopi. You can get it based on, uh, uh, you know, something other than the game of soccer. But if you like soccer, if you like football in other countries, then uh, maybe you'll like this puzzle game that... Uh, uses the equipment keeps it in the front of your mind but it doesn't necessarily replace or have anything to do with the main game and that can be fun that can be interesting in different ways and uh you know test some other skills uh like uh your strategy and puzzling and all that kind of stuff we have uluk which is a euro game about hunters and gatherers being a tribal leader and you can see it's got little badger folk or raccoon folk whatever they happen to be um, meeples are custom. Some of the components have minis in them, but, uh, not to the extent where the characters would be like, you'd be playing a mini and all that kind of stuff. It's more like the buildings or the monuments and you get those free if you, uh, buy it on Kickstarter. Otherwise you'd have to add those on yourself. If you wanted a 3d version instead of some kind of tokens, you get different ancestral spirits, gods, basically you're taking a, uh, a hunter-gatherer society of anthropomorphic animals and uh, doing what you can to feed your tribe, keep them going, have an ecosystem, all that kind of fun stuff. This is very similar to uh, a lot of the games uh, we would play in uh, economics classes. So that part's pretty neat, it's like Populous or any of the older uh, um, God View games uh, for RTS strategies that we used to play on computer and that kind of thing. A simulator uh it's it's neat it's an interesting concept it uh doesn't hit any particular cultures because it's anthropomorphic animals so nobody should be offended hopefully <laughs> and just sit there and have a good time hunting and gathering cooperative deduction and almost innocent sounds fun where you have this progressive story where you're doing whatever you can to prove your innocence and for 30 bucks you have all these different types of characters and wacky things that can be going on um, have a few anthropomorphic animals mixed with humans as the aesthetic and basically you are doing a reverse game of Clue so instead of trying to prove who the murderer is you're trying to prove that you're not the murderer so uh, you get some notepads and different types of things that uh, you normally see uh, different types of crimes, different types of evidence all of it's pretty neat and different player screens so that you can uh, keep all of your uh, deductions hidden until you're ready to reveal them. Uh, Tabletopia and the rules are available. 
so you can play it for free if you want to give it a shot the introduction is pretty neat i'd say if you liked playing clue then this would be something a little bit more complicated uh, and updated to replace it and still be fun i don't know if you pronounce it dwarf sevens or dwarves i'm gonna say dwarves uh, and they just found an interesting way to to write it uh, but you are going to be playing as dwarves expanding an empire fighting dragons fighting monsters doing all of the fantasy stuff but doing it in a more pokemon art style uh, i don't know enough necessarily if you call it chibi style because i don't think that's the case but it's more of a pokemon type of art style where you have these little monsters and things that you fight back with and uh they have been very successful they have several uh expansion packs and other things that have been uh, previously released so they definitely have a fan base and if you're interested in this kind of aesthetic this type of fun then uh you're all set and this looks like uh, snow white in this picture here so maybe that's the legendary part of it um maybe it looks too close to the disney stuff so they can't just say flat out uh snow white but that's up to you if you want to give them a shot tabletopia is a way you can play for free from the makers of descent we have the kinfall chronicles knights fall um they also help make the witcher 3 arcane league of legends so these are people that uh have a pedigree so it's incredible dream studios it's their first time out uh, but it's uh, Kevin Wilson, one of the developers also from uh, Arkham Horror. So somebody that's been around doing stuff for quite a while. You get acrylic standees and tokens to keep the price down. Uh, you get all of these celebrity, you know, <laughs> interviews on, uh, and comments and things on it. So good on them. They must have had enough backing to be able to get all the, the, uh, those folks going together. You can see they have the typical uh, fantasy tropes going on. Um, you know, someone with a bow, someone with some spells, someone with a sword, that kind of thing going on. Uh, for 100 bucks is the cost of the board game. I don't see any minis just yet. It seems to be all either paper or acrylic. So they're trying to keep the price down for sure. Uh, keep the quality up though. And that part's up to you uh, whether or not this is the the fantasy game that you want to play there's so many interviews and they've put money behind it maybe you want to take a look at some of the uh, guys that have played it already and see if it's any different than these games you probably already have on your shelf and you might want to check out we have a relaunch of the fog escape from paradise and you are going to be uh, guardians of an island and trying to fight back the fog so it's another round through i guess the first one didn't quite work as well as they wanted it has some drafting has some tokens um different discs and rings to tell the story with one miniature looks like they have a couple of different things you can use in other games that might be helpful uh, instead of using the paper tokens um but yeah i i, I guess you defend this island as best you can uh, i'm not really seeing a whole lot of turn-based stuff, but I guess if you're going to play in German, this is a good opportunity for you to get uh, a game in your native language too, because uh, that's where it's from. It's from Germany. Uh, they've already hit their goal, so good for them. And you can see if this is the island slash pirate game that you've been looking for. If you like the Power Core game, this is a Call of Cthulhu version of that. Um, I wonder. I think Chaosium owns the term call of cthulhu in that context for games um but maybe it's because it's based on the book maybe they can call it that i don't know it says it's licensed oh yeah so it is licensed from chaosium so they can use that word uh good for them i don't know if it actually has anything to do with the game itself or if they're just tying it in um because i haven't played power core but you can try this out on tabletop simulator and you can get the rules to play it on tabletopia too so that part's all that neat. Um, if it actually had something to do with the tabletop game, uh, the RPG, Call of Cthulhu, I'd be more interested. But I just don't see the integration just yet, other than the fact that it takes place in a themed world that is not Arkham Horror, but still Lovecraftian. So good for them. Uh, maybe I'll give it a shot. I saw Shira on Quackalope did a, a breakdown of it, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Uh, so maybe you watch what her, she has to say 
or one of these other fine folks that gets uh, review copies and you can play it. If you've played Power Core before and you want to throw it down in the comments, let me know if it was a good game. Then we have House of Joust. Uh, if you've been watching the House of the Dragons uh, or House of the Dragon uh, on HBO and they had a joust session in the first episode, maybe you're inspired for more jousting stuff and a card game about it might be something you'd be interested in. You get some exclusive dice. They don't show it to you, but this says they're going to be some exclusive dice. So good for them. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more of how this game plays. And, you know, maybe if they've got some examples, that would be helpful. But uh, it's about jousting. So if you were looking for jousting stuff, something's here for you. We have Philosophy, which is a game about conversation. So I guess instead of just having a conversation, you could pay money to somebody and then have a conversation. Why don't you have a conversation about whether or not we should buy the game? then you'd save the money and maybe you'd know what it is. Um, but otherwise, it's just got some tactics of things that you can do. It's a free print and play if you want to try that. Tabletop simulator if you want to try that. And I guess you're going to be pushing an argument backwards and forwards along some kind of like tug of war system line. And that somehow is supposed to help you advance. I don't know that the theme works for me. Uh, the box is pretty. The name works. I don't know that this is the, the, the game for me, though, that would fit those two things. So, um, yeah, if there was some actual philosophical arguments that were tied into it rather than just the forward and the backward of it, then maybe I'd be more interested. The Glorious Wrestling Alliance Ultra Brawl. Uh, there are a lot of wrestling games out there. Some are just based on wrestling promotions. There's a lot of wrestling fans in the world. Uh, I see the signs everywhere when I'm driving to work for WrestleMania for next year. They're selling tickets. You know, it doesn't seem to be losing any popularity, even though a lot of the bigger names have moved on, gotten hurt, you know, and retired, that type of thing. They're ready for a new um, group of people to be super popular. And why not make some games about it? Why not, uh, you know, do something uh, that is going to get you less hurt than jumping through a table in your backyard uh, but still have some of the fun and you can do like the big finishers get the pin you do all that kind of stuff in this uh, procedure of the match and that part's pretty cool um, it seems to be less about the showmanship of it and then the actual like def trying to defeat the other player uh, as opposed to just getting more audience reaction so if you want that type of wrestling game, and maybe this is for you, then there's some other, I think it's called like Super Brawl, and there's some other ones that are just about the promotion side and getting the audience reaction as opposed to defeating the opponent. And we have Wizard Duel, Magic and Fantasy card game, obviously competing with many, many others. This one just happens to be made by a seventh grader. So um, if your kids want a game that's also made by kids, then maybe this helps. And it is made in the inspiration of Rochambeau. Um, I don't think it's the Cartman version of Rochambeau. Hopefully not. But uh, I've seen that game pop up two or three years ago on Kickstarter. Um, yeah. So it's got some neat abstract kind of artwork. Um, so someone got paid uh, for all that kind of stuff. The layout looks good. Um, seems to be a complete game. I don't know what to trust when we're talking about a seventh grader because they're in seventh grade. They're not even in high school. And I have some minimums on, uh, I think that you at least should be able to enter a contract legally before I give you money. Uh, that's my own personal philosophy. Your kids may feel differently. Maybe they want something that looks, you know, and feels like something that is similar to them. I wouldn't know what a kid today wants I wouldn't even know what a kid from 20 years ago wants. So, uh, you know, maybe that fits within their, their, what they're looking for. If you want cute cat memes, um, I think that's what this is supposed to be. Mitchie, a cat collectible game. There have been plenty of cat based games that have appeared over the years. And, um, this is another one. I don't know what else to say. Uh, you know, they're going to make a cat-themed cartoonish game. If you like the idea of these cats as being cute, like the bread one here, 
then uh, you know this might be the card game for you. It will fit with that, that aesthetic. Um, it doesn't really have a lot of information as to how the game itself plays, unless you want to watch these videos. That part's up to you. I always tell people, don't put things in videos uh, exclusively, but you know, that maybe they don't follow my advice because they don't watch the channel. But you do, so you know why it's a problem. And we have another uh, Michael Vick simulator. This is uh, Rocco Ranger, and it is about forcing animals to fight each other. So, eh, this one's anime themed in that you have the humans, um, like you see, I guess, like Bleach and those type of uh, animes. And then you have uh, not quite Pokemon versions of the animals themselves, but basically still Pokemon. So if you want a five euro version of Pokemon, that is a print and play game. That's what this is. Then we have Zoo Square, which uh, looks, you remember those boxes of zoo uh, crackers? That's what this box reminds me of. For some reason, I, I just ate, so I don't think I'm hungry, but it reminds me of the animal crackers. And maybe that's a good thing, but it does seem very simple. Just a couple of colors, a couple of meeples. It looks like something that you play with somebody very young, and that might hurt the overall bottom line. Um, if they had a little more... Uh, detail thrown into the um, the art pieces, then I think maybe they'd have an easier time hitting their goal. Uh, it's also 50 bucks. So that's a lot for some cardboard. Uh, I don't think that they've quite hit the, um, the price point here that is going to be um, enticing. When you take a look at this type of game, I would say if you could hit for 20 to 25, then people might be more inclined to pick it up. Uh, the age levels that they think that they'd play with these kids, it's just a matter of the kid will age out of it super fast if the artwork is of a certain type, and so you'll get a very limited usefulness out of it. So uh, people aren't willing to invest quite as much money thinking about it in that term. So that can make it very difficult to get even the $3,000, which isn't that high, but it might be too high because the price is too high per unit. If you need a new tra trading card game, Grand Fable is here. As you can see, it's uh, taking a little bit of a lighter approach. Um, it's not necessarily as uh, violent in the iconography as uh, things like Magic the Gathering. It's taking a very cute look. So it's kind of a hybrid uh, art-wise between the Pokemon people, the Yu-Gi-Oh people, and the Magic the Gathering people, which is an interesting place to fit because it also has that feel of uh, video games like Zelda and that kind of thing thrown in, the old school Zelda. Um, and if that's what you're looking for, along with, I don't know, Nyan Cat, Minecraft stuff, <laughs> then uh, maybe this will work for you. And But it, otherwise, it just looks like another fantasy-based wizard versus wizard duel. Solo games are awesome. This is Weavelings in the Wilds, and it is a solo game about meat, murder, and weight gain. So I think you're going to be an animal that eats things. Um, you, you have these little godlike entities. Looks like the uh, angel and devil on your shoulder. You're going to have the different cards as you make your way through this forest or jungle, whatever it is, uh, for 20 bucks, and uh, make your way towards surviving. So it's a neat idea. Uh, what was it like? Uh, Don't starve is the video game. Uh, so it's super popular. It has that kind of feel to it, but just a, an an ancient uh, totemic experience perspective of the the uh, artwork and aesthetic and all that. You can play the tabletop simulator version if you want. Give it a shot. Uh, it seems interesting, and you know if it's designed to play solo, hopefully that means the solo experience is really good. Pirates have been more popular, more pirate stuff coming out in the recent weeks. This is Lying Pirates, and it is a game for you and your friends, can't play solo, um, but it is a reinvention of Liar's Dice. That is the point. It has uh, very thematic uh, pieces. Uh, I like when they don't go too dark with the sepia, when they try to make it look aged and to the point where you can't read it. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is a, um, popular game that is guilty of making the uh, sepia look way too dark 
and uh, this game uh, I gotta applaud them look you can read the stuff <laughs> that's important it's a magnetic game board so the pieces don't fall off um, and you can have the tiles all stacked together and that makes it uh, easier to manage so that part's pretty cool um, you get different coasters and meeples of ships and all that kind of stuff as your components and some uh, decent looking dice these look a lot like the um, Call of Cthulhu, no, Arkham Horror Dice, the original uh, ones that had popped out uh, when the second edition was still around. So uh, it's uh, the way that the the art looks, it's very pirate looking, it matches the box, it matches everything else. So that is an, a, a good point is to have these um, the artwork done on these dice to make it look really awesome. So that's pretty cool. They say it's modular, fast paced and uh, it's got the magnets so it'll hopefully all hold together and stay nice and neat while you play it Akerson supposed to show you how dirty your mind really is from someone from salt lake i don't know i don't know if it can probe the depth of my mind um but uh, i guess you're going to be taking these um sets of letters and then filling them in and uh making the naughtiest version of it so that's kind of neat um, $27 to get started. Oh man. Oh, I think they wish they had some more examples of what it was like, but it's a fill in the blank game. If you have literate and creative friends, then maybe you will enjoy it with them. Watch hockey get drunk. Um, seems to be a drinking game that goes along while watching hockey. I know that hockey has, uh, a lot of people that watch it but just not as many as football, baseball, or basketball in the U.S. Hey, but you're above tennis. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you don't really need a reason to drink when you're watching sports because you're not playing the sport. You're just sitting there in front of the TV. So what are you going to do with your hands, right? Um, if there's people that think it's a great idea, cool. I just don't see enough people to make it super successful. Uh, I, you know, I don't know when hockey's even on TV anymore. Seems to be in the mornings. So if that's when you're drinking, um, it seems to take your whole day. It just seems like a limited uh, group of people that really need this. But if you do, it's on GameFound. Strike it rich, the ultimate game but not a lot of description on it. Uh, it seems to be kind of like a Monopoly game with different investments. Uh, that's the best I think we can get out of this is that it's similar to Monopoly. Good luck to them. Um, you're not gonna strike it rich <laughs> on selling this game uh, without a lot more detail on what type of game it is. Just saying it's ultimate tabletop board game fishing game you know tell people what it is and uh, they won't just scroll through it because they have to go to a list usually to see these descriptions and what your game is so they don't see your page it doesn't just pop up there you have to have some type of information that tells people um you know why or what they might be interested in because i'll be honest if i didn't make this channel i three seconds I'd get through strike it rich and then just see three other words and I would have already passed on it. So when it comes to your marketing, you got to be descriptive. And uh, as far as the picture of all the stuff that's going on, it just feels one of those f like family games that you would play instead of Monopoly. But if you liked Monopoly. And this is another pretty light week for the war uh, gaming individuals. Uh, out of Spain, the best we have is stuff from the American Civil War. I don't know how interested people are in Europe in the American Civil War. Uh, seems to be a fair amount of people recreating it. But uh, I don't know what the fascination is, really. Um, there's so many wars that already happened in Europe. There's all these different cannons. Uh, looks like other carriage pieces they're really tiny uh they appear to be 13 and a half millimeter scale so yeah uh, i don't see that scale very often i see like six and um and 28 but i'm sure it's useful to have that in between 
So uh, if you need it, there's some stretch, stretch goals that you can add to and things like that. I think it might also be really great for dioramas. But uh, yeah, get yourself some uh, Civil War cannons, I guess. Zine Quest, it continues. And since this is the last week of the month and the last episode of the month, then it makes sense that we have a couple things that are just going to slide right through and uh, try to make it to the end. This is Alstrom's Magical Wand Shop, and it is a bunch of wands. This is your uh, Harry Potter wand shop made for 5e. What was the Di Dagon's Alley? I don't know the name uh, of the thing. I haven't read the books, but I had to work on all the movies, and that really burned me out on the whole Harry Potter thing, so... Maybe one of these days, if I have kids, I'll, I'll read it with them. But um, yeah, until then, I'm not going to remember. <laughs> so uh, it's, I know it's Diagon Alley because I had to work on so many of those um, pieces of bonus content that nobody watches that always took place there. So I know John Hurt was the guy that was selling the wands. That's about as far as I go. No uh, uh, xenomorphs popped out of his chest, so it's kind of kind of forgot how that went down memoirs of a hunter also stuff for zine quest there was a lot of journaling pieces and this is one of the last ones to pop out this is a game about you tracking down a particular terrible creature and uh you get eight different categories so that part's kind of neat um how long does it say it's going to run for uh I thought maybe they'd give you a page count, but it doesn't really seem to have that. Oh, 32 pages. So there you go. And, uh, yeah, you know, we run around and track the, if it's a carnivore, what it's been hunting. You know, I saw that Idris Elba movie with the, called Beast that had all the lions and things. Uh, I saw some comic book that had Craven the Hunter in it recently, and I know that they're doing a Craven the Hunter movie. So maybe being a hunter is something that you can get started throwing in the zeitgeist before all that stuff comes out. You might need magic items, and that's what Level Up is trying to give you. They will give you, um, it says it's a PDF filled, but doesn't give quite the number. So, all right. Uh, there's a little bit of examples if you need a plus one long sword and that kind of thing. There are a lot of... Uh, free versions of uh, magic item books and things available on the Unearthed Arcana Reddit. Uh, I'm not sure how well this will compete against it, but uh, I would say you have both options if you need it. It was Deadpool. Deadpool got eaten by a polar bear. Someone found his head in the stomach of it. I think it was an X-Force comic, and that's why I remembered Craven the Hunter, because somehow that all started with the Craven the Hunter uh, storyline. Hunting down things that are weird and crazy could also be part, you know, cryptid. So uh, you have this collection of cryptids to include in your stories. If you didn't want that journaling game, then maybe you can just pull some weird monsters and have your, uh, your party uh, hunt them down and do crazy things with it. Uh, there's lots of different cryptid um, books and monsters and things and games that have happened so it's definitely something that people are thinking about and uh, maybe you'll give this a go and if you are having fun with cyborg and you need a little bit more terminator in it then this is timescape and it is very much based on the terminator franchise because you are going to be a hunter killer robot coming back from the future to stop a uh thing that will in some way create an, an apocalypse everything with borg at the end morgue boy whatever uh it's going to be about an apocalypse of some sort and uh that's what you're trying to prevent so you get terminators you get uh some rich guy in a few different dungeons to go after and a new type of boss that is going to keep trying to attack you and can't be killed just like a terminator and a couple of new classes so that's pretty cool then we have Bullets and Bleed Throughs, Books of Before and Now for 5e. This is an anachronistic game, and it is based on a, I believe, novel series. And I don't know how many there are in the series, uh, how many have come out. <laughs> this person, Jason Flish, uh, Fisher, wrote the book that it's based on, and now has the RPG. I don't know what level they're in, but it's called Papa Lucy and the Bone Man. 
uh, is the first book, maybe more planned. But the idea is you are going to be in something similar to Midworld from the Dark Tower series, which is far more popular. But the idea being a uh, world after the world. And you have different classes of the before folk, crooked folk, the town folk, those kind of ideas. Uh, you can see it is a mix of fantasy and futurism in a post-apocalypse. And if you need 230 pages of world building to help you get through it all, then uh, you're set here. So there's different uh, races and worlds and things, but it's built on a very popular and usable system like 5e and the SRD. So uh, that being the case, you should be able to grasp it pretty fast and uh, just start playing without too much hassle. I like that when people want to create a whole new world that they use a system that's easy to follow. So why not? Why not have the audience ready to go familiar with uh, the mechanics and then they can just start diving in and uh, chewing on your world and enjoying it. We have the Menagerie of Adventures number two. So it's a collection of 5e adventures um, that have been built out. The Hound Knight, I guess maybe because he's got a dog helmet. The Black Skull, the Chalk God, maybe it's some type of uh, golem. And the Wreck of Pater Erdl. So it looks like some type of merfolk thing you're going to go through. And bullet time. Uh, yeah. So neat ideas. Th they sound pretty cool. Um, a little bit of a, a Dali <laughs> inspiration on some of the, the artwork pieces. So if you want to give them a shot, this is the second one. So there is a first one if you wanted to pick that up as well and uh, see a writing sample. The Daily Dread Cyber Dystopian is, uh, you know, is one of those things that also kind of takes place in that same uh, cyberpunk world, that cyberpunk, cyborg, all that kind of stuff takes place in. And you're going to survive the reforms of the authority of freedom. Um, yeah, feels 1984, doesn't it? So if you're into that kind of thing, it doesn't look like it has too much fantastical stuff stuff going on maybe it's a lot more grounded in um you know what humans can really do and not looking for anthropomorphic animals or anything like that so if you want something in that vein then you can try this zine quest zine out and uh, fill it out with all your crazy cool stuff that you want to bring in world of kensi it's another setting for 5e this time it looks like it is based on japanese mythologies I don't know if this exists as a different game. It says it's from the same team that did Trudevang Chronicles, which is also been adapted to uh, 5e. So hopefully it has a pretty good quality. Um, you have the Zenzang School of Death Magic. You have different history and lore between the different characters. Uh, there already are a lot of Japanese inspired characters in D&D. Had to let that truck go by. All right, and then there are plenty more that are going to be added in. You got Kirin, Tengu, Oni, Yure, all these things that have, uh, you know, been in a much different games. Um, they are pretty common. You get different uh, subclasses and things that are specific to uh, this Japanese theme. And let's see if we can go down. I thought I saw this not too long ago. Something very similar to it, also in the uh, Unearthed Arcana Reddit page. So you might be able to find a little bit going on there. Uh, I guess they're not going to describe the subclasses and things in here, but that would be helpful. Uh, pretty good artwork. You know, it feels very much like Adrian Smith stuff. So uh, high uh, quality. It would fit well into probably if you have... Uh, oh, man, what's the one that Adrian Smith did for Simon? Rising Sun. If you have Rising Sun and you have all the little minis and things that go along with it from the monsters, it would probably work pretty well here for you to fight against. Also from Scandinavia is Drakhar Akhthamonar, the Dragon Bane. This is a 40-year-old RPG that has been relaunched for people in English. So if you've been uh, looking to give this thing a shot, you've been wanting to try it, you've been, you know, oh man, I love these Scandinavian uh, myths and artwork and all that kind of cool stuff. Here you go. You can get a download of the Quick Start. It's from Free League. They have a lot of success on both Kickstarters and on uh, producing uh, RPGs that people like, such as the uh, Alien RPG. 
This is something they've been doing for uh, a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, more power to them for bringing things to bigger audiences. As you can see, it's pretty much the biggest Kickstarter of the week. Then we have the Eldritch Book of Madness Deluxe Edition with 300 pages of Lovecraftian stuff for DMs. Um, here's the important things. Profane Addictions. Madness Rules. A system of dread points and uh, some things about uh, the monsters of the mythos and their realms. Different dread lords. This would work great within Ravenloft. So if you wanted to attach this there, um, these guys would be really cool for that. There is a couple of domains of dread that I think already have a Lovecraftian feel to it. Um, you can see what the artwork looks like inside the book. It is gorgeous. So uh, if you want to have a more psychological aspect, uh, more, you know, we have spell jammers, so you can have these cosmic entities going along with it. A spell jammer Ravenloft domain of dread hybrid would be fantastic. Uh, you can give this a shot. There is a previous version and release. So if you had bought it before, then there's some discounts. But otherwise, uh, basically, this is a whole new book, about 60 bucks um, with all new stuff in it. And then for the 13th century, you have this any system tabletop resource of Evesham. And it is got maps. It's got some hooks. And I guess what they're really trying to do is give you a more realistic view of what life was like in England at that time. Um, it says it looks for generic fantasy gaming, like medieval manager, if that's a game. So if you wanted something, I guess, that was more like a... Uh, I don't know, some type of um, uh, Euro game kind of feel. Uh, this has war game rules and other things um, to go with it as well. And it focuses on the year 1260. Then we have a Zardinia, which is a uh, Dawn in the Marshlands muddy drink. It's for muddy people. It's got its own pantheon and uh, some pretty cool artwork. It's a simple book, level one adventure, and you got some really beautiful portraits that you can throw in there and maybe utilize in other capacities uh, over and over and over again because they're really well done. So give this a shot as a very European feel, even though it's made in Kentucky. Then for more boy, we have the Abhorrent Six instead of the Sinister Six and the Babylon Hangover. Um, this is Frontier Scum Adventure and uh, some type of bestiary, I guess, for Morgue Boy. So that's what they're purporting it to be. Um, great. I mean, there's a bunch of people that have already made some. Um, this is all black and white for the most part. I see a little bit of pink there, but, you know, uh, there are... If you, were, if you like Morgue Boy because of its yellows and pinks and all the crazy stuff that it has in it, then this is not going to have all that uh, color for you. But it is going to be a zine and zine quest stuff so it'd be fairly cheap so if you want to give it a shot have some things that you can add in um looks like it's a gun slinger adventure uh based on the hateful eight that's what it's based on so you can give that a go with new monster skills backgrounds random tables because that's what's important on this uh, osr based stuff and uh go from there Ancient Vaults and Eldritch Seat uh, Secrets, more zines. This is the Tulpa book. And um, you're going to be given... Uh, da, 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 da. There's a little bit of in information about the physical nature of the book, but not what's in it. It says it's an introductory adventure in class, but what is it about? Um, it's an OSR project. I guess you could look at this and it kind of looks like where the wild things are, or one of the Studio Ghibli kind of uh, aesthetics. Good luck. More zines with medieval modern. This is neo medieval world building. So it is a uh, way to make anachronistic things happen in your story and uh, fit technology and um, all of these uh, crazy. Um, types of fantasy creatures uh, together at the same time. So cigarettes, uh, vapor capsules, lettuce, <laughs> tablets, different things that uh, you can throw in there to make it kind of work. It's not going to work 100%, um, but uh, sure, 
if it makes the storytelling work better for your futuristic city uh, to separate, you know, the different types of uh, areas. So you got the, the low-born people and the high-born people, and um, it makes the people that have had magic for so long um, so much better and cleaner and all that kind of stuff than uh, separating those places out and incorporating them into the world, uh, mixing them together in different ways might make the world more interesting. Then we had Spelljammer pop up, and now we have Nebula Chaos, which is a different space-faring, space-faring scoundrel renegade tabletop RPG. So uh, if you need more and you didn't get enough from the Spelljammer side, this has more uh, science-based ships and things that you could be attacking each other. There's Lancer, there's Traveler, there's Starfinder. There's lots of different games you could be playing, but not all of them capture the feel that you want, and maybe that's what you're going to find here more uh, towards uh, Starfinder than anything else with the uh, crazy uh, fantasy-type monsters and things to throw in there. A little bit of Bucky O'Hare on top of things. So uh, that part's up to you, which if this is the one that's going to float your boat, then uh, get it on into space, and you guys have a good time. We have Xanamir's Deck of Many Things. The deck has been expanded from a god of chaos and trickery and made physical so you will pull the actual deck itself and you will get whatever is uh set for that deck um i mean it's a neat concept the box looks nice and all that kind of stuff but in my opinion the deck of many things should be used sparingly and it seems to be everywhere there's lots of different other decks to go along with it so if you want this um more cartoony look to it then it works for you pretty well i don't know that there's ten thousand dollars worth of market available for it though then for amethyst 5e it's a 5e world but it's this amethyst uh, sci-fi setting again more sci-fi everything has to go along with the uh, spelljammer release so uh, they've got 1200 pages of 5e content here uh, for you to come out with it's been established and this is just a collection of the pieces uh, with probably some new stuff that has been put into these Amethyst novels um, and brought into 5e. Artwork looks good. Uh, looks like it's got some interesting storytelling. I do not know what's going on with the face here, but you know, it's, a, it's like it's the, the face looks like it's been shifted over. It's not quite the way it should be. But anyway, you know, small critiques, uh, different machines. I've seen this type of stuff happen in 5e conversions before, so you can incorporate all the different pieces however you like. Um, if you like this type of world, you like this type of game, especially if you enjoy the, the novel set setting, then you can check things out. There is a free preview. Um, it's a very Darth Vader-ish <laughs> looking robot man. Um, some of these things look pretty cool, and like I said, with Spelljammer, you might want to find more worlds to incorporate, and uh, this would fit in there pretty nicely. Sword and Sorcery is a game that is based on early D&D, uh, &D, so like the old school essentials uh, area, and this is Black God's Kiss, an RPG set for that world. Uh, I know that there have been some pretty successful OSR box sets uh, before. This one seems to be doing okay. Um, but it's just a little different. So it is uh, built off of C.L. Moore, who was a contemporary, but not as famous as uh, other fantasy writers in the early 20th century. So uh, maybe this will make you a fan of their stuff. You know, set out and find a brand new interesting writer. You know, not, and everybody has to be our, uh, Lovecraft or Howard or you know Asimov or any of those folks. So you know they all had their heyday and did really well. Um, this artwork, as you can see here, is gorgeous and fascinating. Um, you know, the way that they put it all in black and white and everything, it makes it feel like it could be an early inspiration for Giger and other, you know, in masters of the art forms. You get a little bit of a miniature to go along with it. So why not step into some old nightmares and uh, see if they can give you some new good times. 
Book of Riddles is pretty useful, but it's system agnostic. These are just logic puzzles, games, and other things that you don't even need to incorporate into an RPG, but you could if you want. I like having some books of riddles and things as I flip through, uh, you know, just on the toilet or whatever we're reading. <laughs> 44 riddles in one book, 102 in another book, and, uh, you know, it's got the, the nice um, sepia... Uh, vignetting and all that around the outside to give it that aged appeal but you can still read the text which is awesome uh, if you like this kind of thing it's going to be bound in a in a way that makes it look old and maybe that tactile nature um, of the piece will help you uh, make your rpg f group feel more immersed another deluxe rpg setting asking for 50 g's there's so much else going on this week. I don't know how long it'll take them to get there. With 30 days, it's possible to just kind of crest over it. We'll see how it is. Um, but this is uh, Rultmork. So uh, you can see it's got the basic stuff. You get the book. You get some graphics and things in the box to go along with it. Standees. That type of thing. Uh, it's intended for levels 4 to 6. And pushes... Oh, sorry. It's in intended for 4 to 6 characters but levels five to seven. So this is after you do the essentials stuff. This is after most of um, the anthology uh, stories. You can push your characters up to five or just jumpstart them at five. That part's up to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can have different wasteland technologies and visions from uh, a world gone by. There's a hardcore mode. They have this flow or stagnation mechanic that is thrown in there trying to be more brutal. Um, different previews if you wanted to check them out. There's also something about the drow. I don't think it has anything to do with Salvatore. So it's a whole new drow adventure if you like those underdark things. And um, it has an interactive PDF that will go along with it. Uh, so it's got stuff. It's neat. These digital maps, it looks like it's got flickering things. Maybe they're GIFs, GIFs. I don't care what you call it. Um, that you can throw out on the table. So it's a neat way to make all that work. But like I said, it's a hard push uh, to get past that. It has only been a few hours up. Um, so it's possible, but it's going to be hard. When the Witch is Away is a system neutral witch house enclosure. And um, it looks like they have a few different versions that they tried. And it is up to you to make that witch work. You can put in any system. So if you have a system that not many people play and you don't get any other content for, this will work out pretty well. There's some trippy things going on that I'm going to guess they uh, threw into mid-journey and then had it spit out the artwork. <laughs> so uh, a lot of folks have been doing that. I've noticed um, some similarities in the pieces that come back. Like they, they, they look like they've been made by the AI. The Dungeon Delver's Handbook Sourcebook is ways for you can to create dungeons made by morris they've made lots of other pieces of content um different traps tricks puzzles uh ways to suggest on making satisfying underground adventures that's all right that's cool uh i always wonder who changes all the torches you know who sets up all the lights different to heritages which is the new word for races so it should work with the new uh D, &D stuff coming out or one D, &D. A couple of different cultures, backgrounds, and archetypes. So that all is fun. Um, I mean, 13 different subclasses for dungeon delving. I thought all of them already were, but maybe this gives you some more uh, like um, archaeological reasons for jumping down there and stealing stuff. It's using a nodes system. Novelties, obstacles, discoveries, escalation, and set pieces for the storytelling. So if that gives you a system, I guess that's like what uh, the Blake Snyder Save the Cat system people use for making movies. It just gives you something to follow, and that part's pretty cool. You get a few pre-made dungeons to get you started. So, you know, there's a lot of content, a lot of things that are useful to help you out. These guys are not doing so well right out the gate. Maybe they need a little bit of love, but this is Hex of the Hag Queen, and this is where hags have replaced the gods. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, a little bit more information will be helpful. Maybe that, uh, um, maybe not the history of your life story, but more the story of the game. And 
then they'd be able to, uh, to get further along. And we have a nice box, printed cases for card games. So if you have Magic the Gathering or anything, uh, Arkham Horror, um, you know, something that has uh, Marvel stuff, whatever, your deck building uh, stuff, you have a box now that looks nice that you can shove on the shelf. They can stack and um, it is supported by screws instead of glue. But maybe it'd be glue and screws. That would be helpful. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a neat piece, uh, probably some laser cut pieces of wood and it has all these different, uh, uh, graphics that it'll throw along the outside. So it's something that looks neat and protects your stuff. It's about 30 bucks that it's a pretty good price. I mean, I don't know how much the shipping will end up being, but yeah, so you could get four for 140. So it's like, uh, 35 bucks a piece. That's going to be a lot cheaper than if you try to make it yourself these days. Then printable and stackable paint trays. There are a lot of these. They are everywhere. Um, everybody's got their own version, different sizes, uh, things like that. But if you have an FDM printer, and so you can do multicolors and do different crazy things with it, um, these are super handy. I have my own system that I put on the wall. Uh, this one has utility trays. It's really just a matter of when somebody starts painting, then they start needing more and more storage for it. And then otherwise people get comfortable. So if you're a new painter out there and you haven't gotten comfortable with your current system, maybe you'll enjoy this one. Then we have the gelatinous cube jelly soap. This is not the first company to come out with that, but they're always cool when they do. This is soap that stuff is stuffed inside of. So they put dice and maybe they'll throw a mini or whatever the case is. But, you know, clean yourself up. Uh, and, and if you're uh, not using it in the the sink at the time then maybe you can throw it next to the table but it also gives you with all these inclusions something to uh, encourage you to uh, wash them hands and uh, find your way down to the dice a little bit of underground and under dark stuff going on you might want some crystals to find so here are crystal clusters and terrain you pay what you want though so you know you make it up from there uh, some nice pieces if uh, you have a resin printer you can get these nice sharp edges that are super clean which is always good and resin printers these days can come down on 100 bucks or less so really it's you know it's just a matter of whether or not you want to use it um i would use the turbo dork if you can paints make things nice and shiny and uh, uh may help you mimic the translucence which would be pretty cool or you could just use clear resins and then alcohol paint on top and get a real translucent effect if that's what you're going for then we have the printable fantasy dice tower. So if you're bored with your current dice tower, you can pay anything you want and get this one. And uh, see, it looks pretty neat. You can use it as a piece of terrain at the same time or just, you know, something on the shelf while you're not using it. Looks pretty darn neat. Let's see if they got a rolling dice uh, thing to go along with it. Yeah, it looks like everything falls within this uh, cage area here. So that's pretty darn cool. You pop it in through the... I don't know, the observatory, and then it pops out through the courtyard. Then we have a second round of cartoonishness buildings. And, uh, yeah, if you're interested in this aesthetic, it looks a little more rounded. Not necessarily trying to be ar accurate architecturally, but more along the, the need for the aesthetic. You can pop them apart, have your little guys running around. Um, some stuff looks more like a uh, Shire house. And other things look more like they would be in a village. So there is a good variety of different pieces like windmills and whatnot. Give it a shot. And maybe you need some dragons. And these ones are highly detailed. This is Worlds of Dragons 2, which is the second print run from Print My Minis. They had the original Print My Dragons 1. I am reading through Horde of the Dragon Queen right now. And there are a lot of different dragons to fight in that. So it would be useful Every single one of them is named, so it's always cool to have something that uh, separates them out. Um, yeah, and they have different types of dragons. Different, You can get some different characters along go with it too. That part's cool. But you can see some of them have wings, some of them do not. So this is more of a, a dinosaur-looking type, right? These guys here, but they could still qualify as dragons. Uh, who's to say that they don't swim or, you know, just they don't occupy the sky in some way. Some of them have six limbs. Some of them have four. 
and it just depends on what type of dragon you need. There is quite a few options to choose from with a lot of good detail. And then you could also pay what you want for Camille, the sword fighter. She does not always have her clothes on, so I'm not gonna scroll down too far, but you get an idea that she has a sword, she has a leather skirt of some kind usually, and a cotton top, and uh, she is looking like a badass, but it's up to you to paint her up that way. Wow Buildings is always there for you. Um, they come out every couple weeks with some new cool stuff. This time it's not a lot of buildings, but it is terrain type pieces. So uh, a few ruins and they've got uh, some, uh, I guess, buildings that are created out of shipping containers um, and some other simple things that would fit in, yeah, as you can see, with tents. Some of the, maybe this is more like a slum kind of area. And there's lots of reason why you you do that. Different uh, military buildings, or you can use them as hangars. Um, yeah, no one's telling you where to use it, but you can if you need to. And it gives you a lot of uh, different options to change around the time and the, the, the uh, location, you know, theater, all that kind of stuff of wherever the game's being played. And we have Where Legends Fall, Eyes of the Cyber Age. And this is a pay what you want set of robots. So you get mechs with uh, rockets and things, different bases you can attach to it. And then you have some androids that do look a lot like the type you might find in Star Wars as assassins droids. Um, the different types of uh, drones and things that you might find in, I don't know, Westworld. There's lots of other sci-fi uh uh, what you call it, fandoms that they could be part of. This is the inevitable future. If you want to get started on it, you can. It's a $1 pledge just to get started, but if you want to be able to make a commercial use out of it, it's only 12 bucks, so uh, pretty reasonable. And we have Rock'em 3D printable hell terrain. So if we get down here, you can see there's this uh, tower. It uh, has all the skulls and crazy stuff that might be thrown on there and the, the the terrible gates and other weird things you might find. You can break it out into this weird uh, configuration. Um, let's scroll down and see what else we have. We've got uh, demon dragons and devils themselves, different types. Uh, you know, the ubiquitous heads on spikes type of stuff and different dragons. Um, this one being the magma serpent and terrible torture devices, the type of stuff you find in hell. So if you're going to be playing through Avernus, um, like I said, I was reading through Horde of the Dragon Queen. So Tiamat's down there. Um, there's lots of reasons you, your characters might have to go down there. And this is the crazy things you might find as they explore their uh, favorite uh, heavy metal album cover for the most part. So neat stuff if you like to try uh, this kind of thing. Some, some pieces of terrain you can either use as terrain, bases, whatever works for you. Um, there's all kinds of scatter going on down there. Unless your version of hell is, um, you know, waiting at the DMV. Because I'm pretty sure that's at least one level. Ah, what's this? Well, so this weekend I'm going to be going down to, uh, it's the Strategicon Company. But I think it's called Gateway. Uh, 2022 and I think I'm finally going to get to the point where I am uh, going to enter something I painted into a competition so this was an early picture I did a little bit more work on it but uh, it's what I had on the computer and I figured to show it to you guys um, so this is an elder uh, earth elemental and as you can see he's also got this tree wrapped around him and I decided that he looked a lot like a treant, and that was what Archvillain Games uh, on their Patreon, that's where I got the model from because I subscribed to their Patreon, uh, had. It was these uh, treant lords. And I thought, I see them always in green. I wanted something different. I wanted to go in a different direction. So I decided, what about a uh, elemental in autumn? And what about a treant in autumn? And that's what I decided to go with. And I started looking at the model and he has these uh, different power stones. If he's a, a spellcaster, then maybe he's got like iron stones, that type of thing around that makes sense. 
And then he had these pieces of rock stuck on his back. And I was trying to think, like, he's an earth elemental. Um, he's been out there a long time. How do I show age? And I didn't want to show it in iron because that's what the tree is, right? It's done in those rust colors for the changing of the seasons. So what could I do that was different and maybe bring back the green that makes it seem more like a treant? Patina of copper. So that's what I went with. Um, it's like he's put these copper plates up with these stones and then he found these little copper uh, statues that he's been collecting over the years that he, for whatever reason he enjoys. And uh, he um, can camouflage himself by rolling up down into like a little ball and the grasses and things that he's put on his back uh, will hide him. And then he can rest and relax until you know, whatever mage things need to be done or wait out the seasons and hibernate whatever the case might be. So a um, little bit more information as to uh, you know what he looks like and all that kind of stuff. There's different angles and you can see you know uh, from the back he's got his bracelet and he's also got this sarcophagus that he uses as uh, some type of shield. So he's ready for battle but he's basically protecting himself um, and if he puts that shield over his head He's got the stones on his back. He can hide and make it look like he's just a, another grave site, right? So I thought that part was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, I thought maybe he's not around running water all the time. Um, so the copper wouldn't have completely gone out. And eventually, you know, he's going to die at some point. So I didn't want to make it look, you know, super much like the uh, Statue of Liberty where it's all green. Um, but he's maybe been protecting stuff and... Maybe he uh, polishes the pieces when he's uh, up from his slumbers. Different things he could be doing. Tending the tree, that kind of stuff. So, I don't know. I uh, I thought it was a, a story that nobody else was telling. And I figured I'd try it uh, for myself on there. So, with that being the case, you saw what I've been working on. I hope you guys are having a good night. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I would expect the Friday episode to be pretty heavy. Considering it's the first of the month. And I'll get to it as quickly as I can. You guys enjoy the rest of your uh, week. If there's anything you liked, feel free to throw it in the comments. And uh, I'll take a look at it. Subscribe, subscribe, please, if you haven't already. Um, still just trying to creep my way towards, you know, getting the, uh, the monetization. So that would be nice. And then I could afford more paints and things. Pay, have the hobby pay for itself. It's been five years. We'll see how well I do. Uh, maybe on next Tuesday's episode, I'll have some good news and go from there. You guys have a good one.